So the title of this conference is Race, Class and Identity. And I think a lot of people, um, once growing up, are always looking for a sense of identity, a sense of belonging in a world where you're made to feel so alienated from who you are um, and those around you. And what do most people do? They look to the question of race, to the colour of their skin, to create a sense of who they are and their identity. And I think race plays such a major role in constructing an identity for so many people. Um, whether that be due to my just like what food you're meant to like, what music you're meant to like, how are you meant to behave? And I know I give in to those ideas. Like if I go to, like, I always use this example, like if I go to Nando's with my younger sister and she gets like lemon and herb, I'm like, are you even black? Like, why are you getting something so, can you not deal with spice? You kind of give in to those ideas quite easily. Um, and I think your identity also becomes a tool of resistance against the state, against racism that we face, um, and it becomes a unifying measure of, of oppressed groups. Um, growing up, I saw a lot of my family members who were um, not necessarily religious, but becoming much more religious as Islamophobia became a part of society. And I remember myself, I wasn't particularly, um, I've never been... I'm religious, but not incredibly religious, but like I choose to continually wear the headscarf as a symbol of resistance. Um, but it's also identity plays a challenge in what it means. Like um, I am Somali, in, which is in East Africa. A lot of people growing up thought it was in Asia. Uh, people would necessarily, there's an argument that goes around saying that Somalis and East Africans ain't technically black because we have Western features. Um, we have smaller nose, of, lips are slightly thinner, our hair is like curly and so forth. Therefore, we are a black and it gives into that sense of like who's, like as, as we were saying before, who's in and who's out of the group. Um, and I think um, it's like, and it, yeah, it goes into the argument um, around identity and what it means to be black. And you kind of go into this rabbit hole, like whether, um, I know during the Black Lives Matter movement in Britain a couple of years ago, the one that I was a part of, and there was major discussions if Asian people should be a part of the movement, and then that what it would mean if you're mixed race, are you allowed to be a part of the movement or not, and so forth. And it's an endless rabbit hole of what it means uh, to be black, but what it kind of does is take away from the arguments and the challenges that we have to face against racism and the fight back we have to do. And I think it's important to understand where race and racism comes from. It's an invention by the ruling class rooted in slavery. Um, and the ruling class use it as a means to make us believe that racism is a natural thing. Um, that the creation of race, uh, CLR James said, the creation of race and racism goes hand in hand with the growth and dominance of a new capitalist class. Um, not to say that there was no form of oppression or uh, division before the um, creation of capitalism. Of course there were, but it wasn't um, based, there wasn't a sense of oppression on a whole group of people based on their color of skin. Um, uh, but what it really did, it was define black people as an inferior race, um, which led to, which meant that plantation owners could not only justify the enslavement of um, the black Africans that they had captured, but also the uh, enslavement of their children and generations afterwards. Um, and I think what it later led to was the ide uh, ideology of um, a new science which said that Europeans were superior, which I think is incredibly worried that that, sci that sense of racist science is re-emerging in our society today and it's something that we have to fight back against. Um, Race may be invention, but racism is very much there and it's a reality for loads of people. Um, and the slave trade created, the slave trade um, created race and racism, but the end of the slave trade uh, didn't mean the end of racism there. Um, the ruling class still required racism as a powerful tool to divide the working class. Um, they recreate and reinvent racism in order to distract um, uh, sorry, um, to distract uh, and confuse the working class um, against who is their enemy and who isn't, whether that be towards black people, Irish, Asians, uh, 
uh, Jewish or Muslims today. Racism is a, not a product of individual ignorance, but a structural one in our society. Um, and the structural racism uh, that, uh, we, that we could uh, unify against under the banner of politically black. And I think that's what I want to talk about in this other part of the meeting, what it means to be black and what I necessarily mean when I mean black, I mean in terms of the term of political blackness. In Britain, um, the anti-racist movement uh, uh, in the 1962 um, was growing <laughs> after the government uh, imposed its first immigration laws that were specifically targeting black and Asian workers from the Commonwealth. Um, and Britain saw a growth in the fight back against it. It was a movement that um, resisted and that fought back against racist laws, uh, defended campaigns for victims of racist policing, um, and uh, fought back against the justice system um, and so forth. And it also had to, at the same time, fight back against uh, the growth of the far right and the fascists and, and the violence that they faced on the streets. Um, and to create a channel for the anger of young uh, and Asian people who who wanted the sense of having a fight back. Um, and it was quite interesting. Uh, it took influence from the states and other countries around the world, and it had a mixture of politics at the core of it, whether that be black nationalism, Af uh, pan-Africanism, Marxism, um, which also created a direction for class and socialism as a means of liberation. The term black was a political category that unified all those who faced racism because of the colour of their skin um, and it emerged for the need to uh, struggle to fight back against it. And I think you have to kind of give a, a context um, for what was happening. Um, it gave a sense of uh, different minority groups coming together to fight back against racism. Um, and this was taking place in the backdrop of uh, a rising working class militants, uh, the growth of the threat of new, the new Nazi party, the National Front, um, resisting racist attack was essential to fight uh, to fight back, and it, and it was essential that there was a sense of unity coming together between the black and um, Asian community, as the state was either like, didn't really care, didn't want to be a part of it, was incapable, or just didn't have a sense of a need to do it, so people had to take it upon their cells. Um, and it also gave, what it did was that fight back and that unity gave people a radical sense of understanding of the role of the police and the state and the importance of class. Um, the anti-racist movement threw up a number of speakers, uh, leaders of the time who could arti articulate um, the needs of this particular group. And these individuals uh, were a threat to the state in the sense that they could um, rally up people and get people together but also could be used as a tool by the state to be a buffer between the community um, and could be a means of negotiating and i think um after the riots exploded uh, across britain in 1981 um, major disputes and uh, rioting were going across the whole of the country and there were smaller ones apart of different cities and i think um the background of this at that time was uh, a deep political alienation um, against the police, uh, a skyrocketing youth unemployment. Um, a couple of days ago, I was listening to this podcast about this young man. Um, he was a part of the riots. And when he was talking about it and reminiscing, he, you could feel such a voice of empowerment on him, like sense of like, we went for the police. We like had a go. We had that opportunity to do so and had a sense of power and control at that moment in time, which was absolutely amazing. But what was also amazing was to hear how they had looked over to South Africa as a means of inspiration of how they could uh, fight back. And what it led to that they would attack the police and um, shops, offices, and any visible uh, person of authority, um, whether that be through uh, cocktails, uh, firebombs, or looting and so forth. And what it led to was the Tory. Oh, fight. Oh, okay. Yeah. Ah, no, that's. Yeah. Okay. Cool. Yeah. So that's just. Okay. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> I don't know. Um, what it led to was the Tory government at that time um, in power, of course. 
like it's not a surprise like all this turmoil is going on at the same time as the Tories are in government and fearing the anger of the riot spreading to the rest of the country um, as there was a number of um, increase in anger amongst the working class against the cut and job losses and what they did was to appoint a high court judge um, judge he was called uh, Lord Scarman and um, who investigated the riots and to see what happened and how they could prevent it. And what he did was, of course, provide the uh, state and the establishment what they wanted in the sense of his report. He chose not to acknowledge institutionalised racism and kind of brushed it under the carpet. But what he did was uh, attack uh, the Afro-Caribbean and Asian families. Um, but he did also acknowledge that the use of stops and search um, mm -hmm. had sparked the uh, disorder in Brixton and that the economical dis and um, economical racism um, had created a condition for it to be lit. His conditions, um, his conclusion was not to stop stop, uh, stop and search or to do other things, but was to create a carrot and stick approach um, where they increased uh, heavily surveillance and policing on the communities, but also created a program um, which invested in uh, inner cities, uh, a strategy which I've said before to create a buffer between the state and the working class black community. It created a, a new uh, mi uh, black middle class who had both a stake in the, um, in the state and also the system and were willing to like calm down any situations that may arise. Um, but what is quite interesting, even though the Tories use this as a means to bluffer and like harm the situation down as a tool uh, to somewhat manipulate the black working class, the Labour um, government, uh, the left-wing Labour um, members who were predominantly in power across a lot of London boroughs um, saw it as a positive thing. They saw it as a means of um, creating a relationship between the black community and give them a space where they could be a part of decision making, uh, creating a channel where black activists could voice their opinions and shape policies. And what that really did was turn the <laughs> radical voice very much inwards and where individuals were much more willing to look at tidy reforms instead of a bigger change of the system as a whole. Um, but I think even though they saw it in a radical side, it was very much the same coin. It did the exact same thing to the community. Um, but I think, uh, yeah, and, and I think a lot, some um, black activists saw it as a policy that was attempted to divide a rule. Uh, the state funded um, as a means of dividing, um, which led to uh, small um, authorities um, taking the term political black away in a sense and making it, uh, dividing it up to black and Asian and then the question of Asian narrowed that down to uh, Bengali, Pakistani, Indian and so forth and much more creating a much more narrow sense. Like I see, sometimes I see on forms, uh, like it'll say black African and then it will say Somali underneath and I'd be like, are we black Africans? I, mean, I always get confused. I'm just like, what? why the hell are we separate? But, um, but it, that's what it did. It's, it created a sense of we have to divide to um, order to get these uh, funds from the state. Um, and I think th there's also another narrative uh, for the argument against um, black uh, politic the term politically black, which is one that is constantly used in the student union movement um, against the student, the black student section, saying that um, it kind of covers the struggles that other people face. It puts them under one banner um, and it doesn't really see the difference between uh, the racism one individual may face uh, compared to another one. And I think as a movement, what we have to do is create a sense of unification. And I think with the growth of the far right and racist attacks on our streets, we have to learn from the success and failures of the past um, and be upfront about the backdrops of, of our conditions. But we also have to understand um, how it may be corrupted and uh, the state may use it against us. And I think what we have to do is fundamentally have a sense of unity uh, between different groups of people coming together under one banner to fight uh, racism and the state in which we live in. And I think by doing, I don't think like 
oh, I'll, yeah, I'll stop him. Yeah, cool, yeah. I think by necessarily coming together doesn't mean that we always automatically agree. I think there's arguments for the strategy. And I'm assuming Brian's going to talk about that. So I'm just going to leave that to him. I want to begin, if I may, by taking us back to the very first session that we had this morning. Indeed, the title of that session, which is Identity Matters. And I want to reiterate that point, that identity matters. It's a well-known cliche, isn't it, that <clears throat> first impressions count. So I wonder what your first impressions are of me. Uh, you might initially think, well, he's obviously a, a black, middle-aged man. You might think from my club. Thank you very much. <laughs> The, the, check, the check's in the post. <laughs> you might think for my clothing, he's got a bit of an obsession with the Black Panthers. You might think from how I sound, that he's probably a little bit posher than you might have expected when I first stood up. <coughs> well, to give you a little bit more information, I was born in Windsor, which explains the accent a little bit. Um, I'm a barrister, that's what I do as a day job. I'm the son of parents who came over to this country from the Caribbean as uh, part of the post-Windrush generation. You heard that my surname's Richardson, which suggests that the slave owner that held my family was probably called Richard. I'm an Arsenal fan, for what it's worth. So I used to play rugby. Um, I'm a fan. <laughs> I'm beginning to lose. No, so <laughs> I'm a fan of various different types of music, and also for over 30 years I've been a revolutionary socialist and a member of the Socialist Workers' Party. Now, all of those things are part of who I am. They help to make <coughs> me the person that I am. And clearly, some of them are more trivial than others, but they are all a part of my identity. And I make that point because identity really does matter. I think it's no coincidence that some of the most both interesting and well-read books over the last couple of years have been books about identity. Athel Hershey's book, British. Uh, Rennie, Rennie Edo Lodge's book, a, a bestseller, widely lauded, why I no longer talk to white people about race. And another more recent book, which I think looks very interesting, Emma de Beery's book, Don't Touch My Hair, books which touch on and focus on the question of identity. And as Esme said in that opening session this morning, the importance of identity is that it does help people to establish and understand their place in a complex world. And therefore, I think it is really important that we respect the right of every single person to identify themselves in a way that they feel most comfortable with. And of course, we shouldn't make any assumptions about people's identity and how they define themselves. I was reading an article last week, and I have to say, I, I had no idea, I hadn't seen This Is England, so I had no idea that Stephen Graham, who some of you will have seen in Line of Duty, Stephen Graham is a man of mixed heritage. Uh, similarly, Ross Barkley, the Chelsea footballer, has, I think it's a Nigerian grandfather. Uh, something that I wouldn't have uh, thought just by looking at him. And why does identity matter? Because one of the things that we, want to, we really wanted to discuss throughout the day is that identity matters because racism is a real profound issue that has a deeply rooted effect upon our lives. I mean, this workshop is entitled, um, What Does It Mean to Be Black? Amongst other things, it means in very concrete terms that you face discrimination and exclusion and marginalization from your very earliest days, right throughout your life. I mean, you know, discrimination and, and so on. Now, of course, I'm no fan of the royal family, but it's interesting, isn't it, that whole controversy around Danny Baker, even a royal baby, just a couple of days old, days old faces you know, horrific racism at the hands of a radio presenter. But more deeply rooted, being black, Asian, minority ethnic means you're more likely 
to be born into poverty, more likely to be excluded from school, more likely to be stopped and searched by the police, to be charged, to be given tougher prison sentences if you are convicted, to be in prison, to, to be in the, the least prestigious, least well-paid jobs, the worst housing, and so on. And even if you do reach retirement age, as was discussed in that plenary session, you find, as the Windrush generation have found, that even if you've made all of the sacrifices, even if you've identified as closely as so many of those people did with the motherland, as it was characterised, you still find yourself discriminated against, marginalised marginalized and denied the rights and the resources that you have fought and are entitled to. That is the real impact of institutional racism and one of the reasons why having debates and discussions like this and, uh, are so important. And of course, the flip side of that, again, something that we discussed this morning, and I'm sure we'll discuss in the final session, is that uh, identity has often, not surprisingly, been the means by which groups of oppressed people have come together and organised to demand the uh, recognition, the respect, and the resources that they should be entitled to. It's been the way in which many people have come together in order to fight back against racism. You think of the civil rights movement, you think of the fight against apartheid in South Africa, you think of some of the struggles in this country, the Bristol bus boycott, the, uh, the struggles for recognition in the education system. And we should never underestimate the significance and the importance of those struggles. Many of us would not be in the positions that we are in today without those struggles having taken place. Again, to personalise these things a little bit, the fact that I was able to go to university, able to get a half-decent job and so on, is precisely because of the sacrifices and the struggles of the generations of black parents and activists who came before in the 60s and the 70s, the people who recognised that their children were being labelled educationally subnormal and said we are going to do something about it. We're not just going to sit back and take this discrimination, we are going to organise and fight back against it. Fantastically important things that have happened. So, uh, and of course those struggles clearly go on. The Windrush, you know, the, 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 the horror of what's happened around, in, in, around Windrush. The Islamophobia that we see infecting our communities. The racism that we have seen time and time again the, the, the blighting our communities. The rise of fascist and far-right organisations. These are all manifestations of a deeply rooted racism in our society. And so, of course, identity matters and has provided the means by which people have fought back. But again, to restate something that was said this morning, uh, and something that was said by Gary Young in a very, a, 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 a book earlier than the ones I've mentioned, Benny Edu Lodge, uh, Afwa Hershey's and so on, he wrote a book in 2010 uh, called Who We Are and Why It Matters in the 21st Century, in which he said that identity is a good place to start, but a bad place to finish. Let me try and explain that with a couple of concrete examples. Some of you, you'll be aware that Tiger Woods is back in the news. He had a fantastic victory in the US Masters tournament just a few weeks ago. Done rather less well in the tournament than just gone on. But Tiger Woods, of course, burst onto the scene at the end of the 1990s, winning the US Masters, a, a tournament that he, one of the made, you know, racist institutions, the Augusta Country Club. He won their tournament, really announcing himself on the world stage. And Tiger Woods, of course, is black. Well, let me just uh, clarify this. When Tiger Woods was asked about his identity, and Tiger Woods, incredibly proud of his parents, but when he was asked, blimey, <coughs> if he described himself as black, he said no. He said, I, 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 I've never been comfortable with that term. I call myself a Cablin Asian. Yeah? He cr created this whole term for himself, a Cablin Asian. 
Uh, but of course, you know, calling himself, he's entitled to call himself whatever he wants, but it means nothing really beyond him. Similarly, O.J. Simpson. Now, I don't know whether O.J. Simpson did actually say, as Jay-Z alleges in the song, I'm not black, I'm O.J. I don't think he did actually say that, but the fact that he'd spent all his time hanging out with his white mates at the golf club and so on, really denying any relationship with black um, marginalised communities is undoubtedly the case. It didn't stop him being arrested and it didn't stop him when he was on trial for the murder of his wife, reasserting his black identity in order to persuade the jury to, uh, acqu uh, to, to acquit him. So the point is that your identity has to mean something more than what you personally uh, c consider it to be. In that sense, that's why the, it's, uh, we argue that you need to think beyond identity in order to find a strategy to challenge and to overcome uh, racism. Now, focusing on the issue of, of, of strategy, just for the last few minutes that I have, I do want to take particular issue with another one of the books that has come out in recent years, which is this book, uh, Back to Black, Retelling Black Radicalism for the 21st Century by Kehind Andrews. And I make no apology for particularly focusing on it, because there is a key chapter in this book called Black Marxism, and the central argument that Andrews puts is that Marxism does not offer a solution for black people. He says, and I quote, that although Marxism is radical, it is not black. There are almost as many black activists who joined Marxist groups as left once they understood that the politics is undermined by how it views questions of racism. And he goes on to say that Marxism's central problem is its relegation of the question of racism. In other words, uh, although both here and at numerous points in the book, he recognises that Marxism offers a radical critique of capitalism, and he himself is fiercely critical of capitalism. He argues that really what Marxists do is crudely assert that race is less important than class. And in essence, really, what we should be doing is simply focusing on fighting for the revolution. And that once we've achieved this glorious revolution, then issues of racism will be sorted out. And in presenting that characterization of Marxism, he specifically focuses, in fact, on the SWP. In fact, he specifically focuses on the SWP in Birmingham. <laughs> it, 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 it may well be, it may well be that the, meet, the particular meeting that he's talking about is one that Claudia attended. It may even be that the particular person he's focusing on is Claudia. I don't know whether you can say that or not. But he says about this particular meeting that members of the SWP were present and brought their rhetoric with them. And he goes on to say, Malcolm used to joke that the feds always lingered at black community meetings. In Britain, it's not the feds who were ever present, but the SWP <laughs> or some other variant of the left. Now, on one level, that's quite flattering. Now, I'd, I'd like to think that we are ever present at these meetings. I think it probably isn't the case. But the rather more less flattering point is that he says that an undeniable part of this hyper presence is to lecture us that our problems are really about race and class. In other words, wait for the revolution and then your problems will be solved. Now, is that really the case? Now, I'm not, I'm not I assure you, I'm not an overly sensitive soul, but I, I might respect those arguments if Andrews had shown any indication that he's either read anything that we've ever uh, written or, or, or attended very many meetings where we talk. I mean, he certainly had, you know, I may be particularly sensitive about Say It Loud because I edited the book, but there's no reference whatsoever either to the book or the arguments in it or the things that we actually do or say. Because if he did actually engage with the things that we do or say, he would know that that is a crude characterization of what we actually do. I certainly would not have re remained a member of the SWP for 30 years if I had just been lectured about waiting for the revolution. 
the whole point actually, the central reason why we wrote this book is to discuss the, the, both the theory and practice of fighting racism. Uh, I mean, I joined because I, 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 having attended initially a meeting which was about br police brutality, which was to organise a demonstration against police brutality in Manchester. When I turned up for that demonstration, the SWP and its placards were there. Many of the other guys who had been, you know, loud in talking at the planning meeting were not there at all. And really what I'm saying is that it highlights for me the fundamental point about real Marxism is that it's a combination of theory and practice. And what, the reason why we wrote this book was to highlight theory and practice. We wanted to show that there is a history of anti-racist struggle here in Britain and it's a history of working class struggle and of black and white unity. And, that, and, you know, that, that, and, and I'm not saying that there haven't been a need for black activists to fight against racism. The very things I highlighted, the Bristol bus boycott, the campaign around education, that start, those started off with black community activists campaigning often against white workers, white trade, you know, white-led trade unions and so on, but it culminated in support and solidarity which strengthened those struggles. Um, and, you, you know, you, you think, if you look at the history of the things that I, I am particularly proud of, the anti-Nazi League in the 1970s, the work of Unite Against Fascism in the 1990s, the work of Stand Up to, Race, Stand Up to Racism, today, those campaigns are not about waiting for the revolution, they're about campaigning against racism today in the here and now, because those things oppress and, and uh, discriminate against us. Yes, of course, we seek to carry a broader argument about the need to strengthen and deepen and extend those struggles. But it's not about waiting for the revolution, it's about campaigning here and now. And I, know, I know I need to finish, but I do want to take issue with a particular, in terms of strategy, the argument you see that uh, Andrews argues is essentially that what we need is a separate what he calls black radicalism, a black radicalism which he says can unite black people against whiteness, which he says is in the DNA of the social system. And therefore, overcoming whiteness is impossible because it is a product of the structural condition, a psychosis caused to ensure that the system remains intact. And you see the particular criticism that he was making at that meeting in Birmingham was, his argument was, this was ridiculous. This was a Black History Month meeting and members of the SWP turned up in order to argue that people present at that meeting should support a potential teachers' strike in Britain about pensions. And that what happened was that people crudely equated the struggle of teachers in Britain with that of white... of... of, of um, South African miners. And Andrew's argument is, this is ridiculous. There is no connection between the two because those white workers in Britain are the beneficiaries of the system of, uh, of capitalism. They benefit from the exploitation of workers in the global south. And, far, and because they benefit, they have no progressive role to play in uh, overcoming uh, what the, the, the and supporting the struggles of people in the global south. Our argument is a different one. We do not fetishise workers and have some rose-tinted view that workers are just a kind of wonderful thing. There needs to be argument. We accept white workers can and do accept racist ideas, but there are, and, and hopefully because I need to shut up, we can have a discussion about this. There are material reasons why people can and do accept those ideas, but there are also material reasons why people can do and historically have challenged and overcome those ideas and that the potential for black and white unity is real. And the reason why we do argue about the importance of class 
is because collectively we believe that workers not have the collective power, the ability, not just to uh, smash this system, but to create a completely different system, a system based upon equality, humanity, and a fair share of the world's resources.